Hi, everyone. Thank you very much. My name is Del Cullum. Uh, I do uh, animal rescue and rehab and removal and relocation and education and anything that has to do with wildlife. I've probably got my hands in it. Um, I'm very honored to be able to come and speak to you all today. Uh, thanks to Mike Patini who invited me. Today I'm going to talk about two uh, critters that um, I spend a lot of time with and I just want to go over uh, them with you, showing you their unique nature and also I'm going to set a timer for myself. I practiced this about four times, <laughs> so I want to see how I do. So, uh, but as we, as you can see here, we're first, I'm going to also stick to notes because I, I, I speak to a lot of children and I don't want to make the mistake and refer to one of these animals as a fuzzy wuzzy little cute creature to you folks. So I'm going to go by my notes here. Um, we're going to talk about the opossum first. Uh, over a hundred species of opossum in the world, only right here, the Virginia opossum lives in North America between uh, southern Canada and Mexico. Uh, the Virginia opossum is our only marsupial in America, and would, it would be the only marsupial in North America uh, if it wasn't for the Mexican op the opossum. There we go. Uh, Tila Quacha is uh, uh, the Mexican opossum. And uh, the opossum is also often referred to in America as opossum. And that's okay, unless you live in Australia, where the possum is a completely different animal. And I believe that there would be the common brush-tailed possum of Australia. And uh, uh, they, they uh, do not call it the opossum. However, here in America, it's okay. We both know what we're talking about. Um, the opossum may look clumsy, and uh, they are a lot smarter and more beautiful than humans, a uh, uh, lot more beneficial to humans than many of their woodland neighbors. Uh, before I get into the benefits, let me talk about a little bit about what makes the opossum so unique. Um, we mentioned uh, the marsupial status, uh, but what does that mean? Well, one of the most recognizable features is that they have a pouch, and the pouch is actually called the marsupium, uh, where the marsupial gets its name from. And it's where the babies developed after an early stage birth, and what connects them to their Australian cousins, like there's a picture of the marsupium in an opossum showing some of the early stage embryos uh, that have crawled their way um, from the, uh, the uh, uh, birthing exit to this pouch called the marsupium. Um, they are related to marsupials such like, as the kangaroo, wombats, Tasmanian devils, and of course, the koala bear. They all have marsupiums, and that's what uh, connects these creatures. I don't, I don't want to skip over the unique birthing process, so, so back to the marsupium. First, the uh, female has um, two uteri, which rightly accommodates the male's bifurcated or forked penis. Uh, it, uh, after 11 to 13 days after mating, up to 20 little embryos about the size of a dime or smaller uh, make their way up through uh, the fur of the opossum in search of the marsupium. And it's quite an amazing trek considering these are very small dime-sized, blind, naked, living embryos crawling up through the, uh, along the belly that the mother will actually lick a nice, wet, moist trail to help guide them to that uh, marsupium. And here you can see how small they are. And as I said, they can have up to 20. 
They're about half the size of a honeybee, and they swim blind through the mother's fur in search of the marsupium. Uh, as I said, the mother licks a moist path, which makes this transition easier. The embryo reaches the pouch and attaches to one of 13 nipples. So only 13 babies out of the 20 can survive. And that, of course, depends on if all the teats are functioning properly, which isn't always the case. So uh, as many teats as there are functioning properly will, be, uh, will, will, will give you uh, the, the amount of um, babies that will have a, the best chance of survival. They will develop in the marsupium for two to three months, depending on, depending on the litter size. An average litter is eight. The babies are called joeys, just like baby kangaroos and other marsupiums. And the mother can have up to uh, one to three litters per year. Uh, no particular time. Uh, I, I, in my business, I tend to find out they don't really um, often have babies during the colder months. However, I've had situations where they have. Once they are big enough, they'll emerge from uh, the marsupium and ride on mama's back. Their eyes will open after two months, and they are weaned at three months. And they're good to be on their own at four to five months. And there's that difference in months there, because all depending on how many uh, uh, can, can uh, survive in the pouch. If you have one to two, these timings will be a lot shorter. But if it's a full, full pouch, all, all 13 nipples have been attached to, then the processes will take the longest period. So that's the difference in when I say four to five months. At that point, mama will lose her maternal bond uh, as soon as the youngster's attention is drawn elsewhere and they go their separate ways. And that's usually when I end up getting them. Um, what happens in a lot for me in, in, in the cases where I end up getting them is before they're old enough to be on their own, and we have a pretty easy way of telling that. When we measure from nose to rump at uh, set between seven and nine inches, that's okay. We know that they can be, you know, survive on their own. Anything smaller, we, we take them in and rehab them till we make sure they get to that length and we feel confident at that point to release them. Um, but the way I find them mostly is when they follow mom at night and they're following behind her, and as most animals do that you, who use their tails to, to feel and, and travel at night, nocturnal animals, when they go around foundations of homes, they drag their tails, just like mice do, they drag their tails that touches the wall as they go, and that kind of gives them an extra visual uh, aid as they tra you know, traverse through the night. Well, what happens in some of these cases with the babies following behind is when mama goes around those, those basement window wells, the babies go straight and fall in. And this happens way too often. In fact, if I get a call, I have a baby opossum in my window well, I usually go check all the window wells and let them know that they have about six babies in their window wells, uh, at, at which point we, we take them in and, and uh, uh, take care of them. But what happens is, you know, at that point, mama begins to lose that maternal bond. She goes back, she looks down, there's nothing she can do, she takes off. She knows that, uh, you know, it's important to keep, keep uh, the wheels spinning with, with the other ones. Um, I said seven to nine inches from nose to rump, not the tail, and that allows them to be on their own fine. Opossums have impressive memories. They have opposable thumbs, which makes them great climbers. They also have well, there's, there's a picture of their claws. You can see uh, they've got uh, quite the nails, very good for, for uh, climbing, and they have that. You can see the thumb 
They are turned around backwards, which means they can go up a tree this way. They can turn around and come down a tree front ways just by taking that thumb, bringing it back down here. The raccoon also has that. But what the raccoon doesn't have that the opossum has is a prehensile tail, like a monkey. Okay? And uh, I find this uh, extremely interesting. However, um, opposed to uh, some of the rumors that we were raised with, the uh, tail is not commonly used for hanging, and it definitely is not used for hanging upside down when an opossum sleeps. I so remember a book that had a picture of a possum sleeping, uh, hanging by his tail when I was a kid, and I wish I could remember what it was. I'd like to write that uh, author a, a letter, but um, uh, totally uh, n not correct, or I've never seen it anyway. The babies do sometimes hang from the tails, but not for too long. It's, it's just something that's not commonly done. The tail is actually used uh, for uh, grabbing objects and um, uh, grabbing nesting materials, uh, keeping itself stable when it's climbing up and down trees, and um, uh, it, can be, it can be used to grab things, and quite tightly. In fact, when I handle them, they wrap your, their tail around your wrist. They can give you quite a little squeeze. So it is a powerful appendage, a fifth appendage, if you will, uh, of, of the opossum. Uh, of course, monkeys have prehensile tails, uh, but in America, there are a small few who possesses this appendage, which makes, it, which makes it unique to the opossum. However, there are a couple other animals that also in America have prehensile tails, and that would be the harvest mouse, who grabs onto items with their tail. And of course, we saw a picture earlier, uh, just before me, of a seahorse makes perfect sense, grabs with its tail. Another one that is really obvious, and you probably wouldn't think about it until I tell you, but a snake. Of course, its whole body is prehensile, but the tail in most particularly. So um, those are just a few, few of uh, the other animals that have that feature. The opossum also holds a title for the most teeth in a mammal in America, okay? They have a beautiful set of 50 teeth that they love to show you with a big smile. Of course, when I speak to the kids, I always let them know that that's in fact what they are doing is smiling. However, um, that's not always the case. Uh, and uh, I will tell you, um, having dealt with a, a lot of opossums, uh, when they do bare their teeth in an aggressive manner, I have never been bitten by an opossum. It's the funniest thing because they'll open their mouth and if you put your gloved hand up to them, they'll, 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 uh, they'll poke at your hand with their mouth open. They don't actually grab on you and bite. They just threaten you like that. And we all know, because they have something else up their sleeve, that that doesn't work. But we're getting to that. We're getting to that. Okay? Uh, they have the most teeth of any other mammal in America. They would... Um, uh, be the, have the most teeth in all of North America if it wasn't for the giant armadillo, who uh, is native, uh, again, down uh, in Mexico and has a less impressive and hidden set of 80 to 100 teeth, okay? Um, they don't smile, so you don't get to see them often because of the makeup of their, of their uh, facial features. Um, however, uh, that's the only animal that keeps the opossum for holding the best smile uh, winner. Okay. Um, how do opossums benefit humans? I'm glad you asked, because I've got some answers for you. Uh, the answer lies within some of their additional unique abilities uh, of this awesome creatures. Marsupials have a lower body temperature and a lower blood temperature than most mammals in North America which provides an unsuitable incubating environment for most diseases, particularly rabies. Of course, it's not impossible for an opossum to, to get rabies. 
it is very, very unlikely. In fact, we would have thought it would have been impossible, however, there was, there is uh, uh, been documented one case of it. That's why we, we, we won't say that uh, it is impossible. Uh, opossums are also immune to, not other opossums, uh, snake venom, which is quite interesting. All snake venom, except for the coral snake. And of course, the coral snake, like the cobra and the black mamba, are different when it comes to their venom. Um, they have a neurotoxin venom, um, second deadliest venom after the black mamba in the coral snake, which you can find southeastern uh, in Florida, um, which causes rapid paralysis and respiratory failure. And of course, like I said, it's only dangerous to opossums that are living uh, in, in southern Florida. However, um, the fact that opossums are uh, immune to all other uh, snake venoms um, made it interesting to scientists who did isolate a peptide, a small chain of amino acids, okay, that they isolated from the opossum, and it's presently being used now and studied uh, for an anti-venom and has been very successful in, in, in uh, lab animals. Boo on lab animals. <laughs> but unfortunately, or, or fortunately, uh, they are uh, showing that uh, um, there is some success in that. So there's one benefit to humans. It could be a whole new uh, avenue of anti-venom, okay? Opossums are clearly clean animals. They lack, largely lack sweat glands, which render them odorless, believe it or not. Okay? They clean themselves constantly and meticulously, like house cats, using their tongue and paws. And like many small terrestrial mammals, they are magnets for ticks. However, the greatest benefits to humans is they love to eat ticks. According to the National Wildlife Federation, an opossum will consume 90% of the ticks that attach to them. They also concluded a study confirmed by the Cary Institute of Eco Studies, Ecosystem Studies that a single opossum can consume up to 5,000 ticks per season. And that areas with a larger opossum population had a significant decrease in tick activity, tick activity to complete elimination. So, as a trapper, I'm telling you, don't sweat the, the opossums. Don't call it, don't call me. Let them be. They're not the type of animals that are gonna cause structural damage to your home. They might go onto your porch, okay? They might eat some of your cat food if you feed them outside, which is a no-no anyway. But um, they're good to have around. And I have customers who have uh, forced me to make a list of people who want the opossums that I trap. And I get them every year, every summer, and I'm glad to uh, find homes for these animals because I really believe this could be uh, one of the, the answers to our tick problem. Um, and as the studies continue, um, they're, they're, they're finding that this is, in fact, uh, a breakthrough. Um, opossums are very social animals that will share their dens. They're nocturnal animals that see very good at night due to their large dilated pupils. They are extremely omnivorous, rarely leaving anything behind, including shells and bones. As a rehabber of opossums, we often, um, we know that uh, uh, we have to feed them a lot of calcium. So they have to eat a lot of eggshells, and when, if, if you feed them chicken, perhaps, you, you gotta make sure they eat the bones. And they will, because they, they thrive on calcium, and it's very important to their system. They communicate they communicate with soft clicking sounds 
and the babies sometimes have these sneezy sounds. He's like, and the mommies will answer with a, that's the sound an opossum makes, almost exactly that sound. They also, however, will growl and hiss and even belch when they're threatened by a predator. And if that doesn't deter the danger, they have a fail safe. It's called thanatosis. It's a form of tonic immobility, more commonly referred to as playing possum or playing dead. I prefer playing possum, especially when I speak to the children. Uh, it's a state of natural paralysis, an involuntary uh, uh, paralysis brought on by excessive stress. And this comatose state can last up to four hours and usually deters most predators that typically avoid carrion or dead rotting flesh, which is what carrion is. Uh, this is further, further accomplished by the emission of a most foul and deterring odor um, from their anus, and it's a complete deal breaker in the appetite department. <laughs> I mean, uh, for an animal that has no sweat glands and relatively does, is odorless, it's amazing the odor these guys can put out when they're in this threatened state. And um, uh, again, it's involuntary. So it's, it's, it's a, a shame, however, that they're so sensitive to this thanatosis because they could be running across the road and just the sight of a car coming <laughs> could set them into this panic state and they could ride on the road. So a lot of times, and we often tell folks to check, check, you know, uh, roadside roadkill opossum. If you have any interest in these animals and you want to see if there's babies in the pouch, I suggest you do it. And if you feel funny about reaching in there and grabbing the babies, it's as simple as taking the whole dead animal, putting it in, covering it in a blanket, scooping it up, putting it in a box, and bringing it to your vet or your local rehab uh, facility, a wildlife rehab facility. You don't have to get involved in reaching in this pouch and pulling out uh, the babies if, if they're still around. In fact, most of the time they'll get thrown from the pouch and you're gonna have to scoop them all up. Um, uh, uh, so sometimes it's not even because of getting hit by a car that they're laying on the roadside. They just did it out of stress. So again, if you, if you care uh, enough to want to check these animals, it's always good to check them whenever they're on the side, unless they really uh, have the appearance that they've been run over and, and uh, things look a little bit more messier. Um, the young can also play dead. It's involuntary, they don't know, they just do it. Although it's a very recognizable trait of the opossum, it's actually the, the least unique characteristic, as many animals, including fish, can experience toxic immobility, okay? Um, sharks, they show you the sleeping sharks. That's, that's what they're doing. You can hold a lobster and rub the shell the right way, or. A, turn a chicken upside down, and they call it hypnosis. These are all tonic immobility. Um, these are in, in, inducing tonic immobility um, because you can. Picking a puppy up, when a mama picks a puppy up, they pick by the scruff of the neck. If we do the same thing with a baby puppy or a kitten, it kind of falls into go ahead and do what you gotta do because that's the spot that, create, that induces different levels of tonic immobility. Humans can also experience this on two levels. Severe shock is a, is a form of tonic, tonic immobility. When, when you're so frightened, you, you freeze, that's, that's, that's tonic immobility. But even a more, more uh, um, severe case would be fainting. Fainting is human thanatosis. In fact, I almost fell into tonic immobility when I opened my uh, fuel oil bill for this one. <laughs> it's very, very common. Although we think, we think of, of playing dead as a unique characteristic of the opossum, when, it, when actually it's, it's quite common. 
the hognose snake is a great example. I love the hognose snake. If, if you threaten it, it wags its little tail like a rattlesnake. If that doesn't trick you, it flattens its neck out like a cobra and starts hissing. And if those two snakes don't scare you, it turns over and it plays dead. And I think that makes the hognose snakes one of the most unique and awesome uh, reptiles in our animal kingdom. This is just amazing behavior. And we have this right, we have these animals right here on Long Island. In fact, in East Hampton, where I am, they're constantly on the beaches. They love beach toads. Um, they love the sand and the beach grass. That's your habitat. So uh, if you ever go out there and you see these snakes, uh, have no fear. We have no venomous snakes here on Long Island, thankfully. The next animal I'm going to talk about, this is actually the wrong slide, uh, <laughs> is an F-16. It's the wrong specs. Actually, I want to go to these specs. It's equally, it's an equal, uh, uh, e e this is nature's weapon against us pes pesky humans, okay? I like to call these animals nature's marines, okay? Because um, their specs are, are equally as impressive as the specs of an F-16. Let me read you some of them, okay? They have a wider body and low center of gravity. It allows these critters to push over lar larger objects heavier than themselves. They have collapsible spines. It allows them to squeeze through narrow spaces. They can swim up to five miles an hour and tread water for hours. They preserve memories for tasks up to three years. They can detect a wide range of noises, even subtle movements of earthworms underground. Their front feet have an incredible sensitive network of nerves that relay three-dimensional images to the brain, allowing them to see their food in the dark. Now, am I talking about a sophisticated technological weapon? Indeed I am, okay? And if you own a home, Indeed I am, because these, these critters can be, uh, e you can either live with them <laughs> or you can live with them because they're not going away. Uh, however, I do have a couple things I can tell you. So it's gonna be okay, okay? You can raccoon proof your house. Um, of, of course, I, I can't cover all that today. That's kind of my teaser. You're all gonna have to call me to find out how to do that. And we'll, we'll get you that information later. Anyway, uh, the Native Americans, the Powhatan word was arakune, uh, which meant animal that scratches with its hands. Uh, the, the Aztecs called them uh, mapachi, one who um, takes everything in its hands. Even the scientific name, procyon loader, okay? Loader is Latin for one who washes, all right? And this, rem this reminds me of growing up as a kid in the 60s and 70s. We used to watch the family hour of Walt Disney where uh, they would show the raccoon who broke into the cabin, people left some food in, and they came out and they're washing the food uh, in the river, which led people to believe that raccoons were very cleanly when they, when they eat and they washed their food before they ate it. That's not the case. It's much more interesting, actually. Um, as I began to learn about the raccoons, I learned how, how sensitive their, their paws are, uh, the pads on their paws. This, this, is, this is key for the raccoon. Um, they don't actually wash their food at all. In fact, raccoons have a heightened sensitivity to touch. I like to describe it like this, the pads on their paws. Their front paw pads react to touch sensation like our taste buds react to flavor. Okay, if you can kind of understand what I mean by that. And getting the paws wet heightens the sensitivity level just like a wet tongue would be more sensitive to, to taste than a dry tongue. So that's why, an ant, why a raccoon tends to get those paws wet. It makes them, their, their, their hands more sensitive tools for what they use that, that sense for. And uh, um, it, it does also, however, I found in, in the business, is uh, when they do get their hands wet and it does stimulate them, um, it also stimulates other parts of them. 
particularly their bowels. So those who have pools and have had the problem where raccoons will poop all around the outside of your, the, the pool or on top of a pool cover, that's because they get in the water, they wash their hands, they're playing around, they're getting all that sensitive feeling, and it just stimulates them to have to go to the bathroom. That's why you would see that. So when you see a lot of poop around your pool, you know that, they're, that raccoons are coming there regularly to sensitize their paws, at, at which point you, you, may, you may want to uh, observe that or make sure you're not leaving food out and, and, and such. Um, let's see. Their sensitive pads and great hearing also makes them masters of finding underground food, such as grubs, earthworms, and even moles who are after the, um, uh, the same foods. Um, the problem is, is raccoons will uh, tend to, when they're searching for grubs and earthworms in your lawn, will tend to tear up your lawn uh, to this degree. Um, Sometimes you wonder what's worse, the mole activity or the raccoon activity. So uh, it's, it's like uh, fighting a two-edged sword here. Um, however, that's when you see this type of activity in your yard, that's what it is. The raccoons walk across the yards. They can feel, they can sense the movement of grubs and earthworms underground. And they're able to detect that, dig it up, pinpoint it, and it makes a great meal for them. Uh, raccoons are extremely smart. They often climb high up onto rooftops and get a grand perspective of everything uh, during the nighttime opportunity. Uh, while they walk across your roof, however, because of their sensitive paws, they can easily detect weak and vulnerable locations in your roof, which, if they are inclined, and they usually are, uh, they will breach and explore your rafters or your attic space. Even, um, even a simple soffit breach can gain them access to a world beyond your walls and above your ceiling. And they know you're down there most of the time, but they know that that's your space. And they have no, um, they have no reason to want to be in your space. They want to remain up in that attic space where they know you don't go. Um, and that's why sometimes even though they know you're there and you know they're there and you bang on the thing, they'll still remain because they know that ceiling is their safety, they're, they're, uh, uh, they're safe. And this is quite a bit of damage. Uh, this happens a lot when a raccoon rips that shingle off initially and he doesn't get in or the lathe is too close together, they'll continue to keep pulling roof pieces off in search of a bigger space. I've literally seen raccoons take half a roof off <laughs> just to find a space. And if they don't, most of them will usually leave. But you'll be missing half the shingles on a house. And, and it, it's hard to picture that, but it's the truth. I've literally gone to houses with half their roofs gone. And the people didn't know it. Of course, they were away. Okay, and then their caretaker gives them a call. Got a problem. Okay. Um, it's, quite a sh it's quite a surprise. But sometimes these, these little guys are determined. And this is, uh, this is what, what you're in for when they get determined. Okay. And if you're really lucky, and you usually will be. Um, Mama raccoon will use this space, okay? And here I use a thermal camera sometimes to locate. If somebody says I hear things in my wall, I want to make sure it's in the ceiling and not on the roof. Cut the time in half now. I'll use a thermal camera. Here are two different. Here's a raccoon, and there's his ba There's the babies. Okay, they're both emitting heat through a sheetrock roof. Once I trapped Mama, I re we retargeted the babies, and all I had to do was cut a hole that small. Just enough to get my fist up and grab the babies. It's that easy now. Used to, used to have to just go, 
nope, not there. Whoops, <laughs> let me cut another one here. Whoops, and you'd have a Swiss cheese in your ceiling. Those were the days. Now, uh, thermo camera, it's a little less invasive. People love it. I love it. Um, uh, a female can have uh, a litter of two to 10 babies, okay? The average is four to six. I see this getting bigger as the years go on. And, and I, I really believe it has to do with um, uh, the availability of food, okay? Um, I highly recommend people that have uh, chimneys that don't have caps on them to also put caps on their chimneys because a flue is an ideal birthing location um, if the home is vacant during the winter, okay? And here's the deal, folks, it's pretty simply, simple. If you cut down a lot of trees to build a house, you're probably gonna cut down a raccoon's house. So if they're going to, that was my timer. I guess I got five minutes. Am I good? No, no, you're out of time. I'm out of time? Well, basically, basically, I, I, what I wanna get, what I make, make clear is this. You can do things to protect your home, um, to uh, keep animals where they belong. Raccoons have, should be living in trees, okay? They need the habitat. Problem is, we continue to build, the habitat continues to shrink, but these animals don't stop, don't stop. We live in an area where food is very available. We feed our pets outside, we feed feral communities, we have uh, 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 summertime eateries that throw surf and turf away. These guys are eating it. They're getting big, they're getting healthy, they're having larger litters, Okay, and the problems are gonna persist. So you have two choices. You either learn to live with them or you're gonna give in to them because they're not gonna stop. And I'm telling you now, you can do it. You can raccoon proof your house very easily and you can live with these creatures and they will not destroy your property or your home and you can enjoy nature because that's what it's all about. Wildlife matters. We need it. And this is a great opportunity to learn how to live with some of the more invasive or nuisance creatures. That's what's important, getting to learn to live with them. So folks, if you have any questions or you have re repeated problems with raccoons, okay, year after year, please, you're welcome to give me a call. There's no charge. I'll give you the information, okay? If I can help you, I'll help you, and I'll certainly charge you at that point, but, <laughs> but I can certainly give you the information, okay, and tell you how to get it done, because I really feel that if everybody would pay more attention on learning how to live with nature, rather than try to figure out ways to eliminate some of these, these, these animals that, that tend to be a nuisance, I think we'll all feel better about ourselves as well. Okay, I'm all about wildlife. I thank you all for listening. Thank you.